Hello everyone, welcome to yet another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Today is April 25th, I think, 2017, and it was precisely two years ago to this day that I moved to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, leaving uh, Chambersburg, PA, in Franklin County, and I moved to um, the uh, Pennsylvania uh, part of Appalachia. Johnstown is a uh, extremely poor area that used to be a uh, uh, central part of, of American industrialization through coal many years ago, and I'm uh, proud to be here. Um, there's uh, a mentality around here very much my own. Uh, Johnstown used to be a hub of the Orthodox Church, the Slavic, and all the old believers in America um, for some time. And two years ago today, I founded the St. Raphael Ski at the time um, under the autonomous metropolitan, but uh, we had our um, misgivings with each other after many years. And presently, I am under Metropolitan Damascene of Moscow uh, from uh, the Catacomb Church there. That was under the uh, Metropolitan Vitaly of the Synod Abroad for some time. And I'm quite happy to be there. And we are building the church in America. He has, he has very little in, in this country. Um, and for all those who have assisted me in that period of time, you know who you are, and I, I want to thank you very much. And it's not just the money, really. Um, it's the fact that there are people out there who are willing to give. When I had the money, when I was stable and had a family and everything, um, I gave all the time. I gave to our decrepit monastery in New Jersey. I gave to Mike Hoffman when he was first starting out uh, online in, in around 2000. I gave to um, uh, E. Michael Jones. Uh, I gave to these people who I thought were worthwhile, these people who I'd been getting a lot of material for free. And I said, I can't do that. I have it. So, therefore, the movement can happen. And I'm proud to say, although now I'm a recipient of charity, it's wonderful that makes me feel, um, for a long period of time, I was a giver of charity. I ask the assistance of my listeners, not because I'm some pathetic case here. I'm always going to be a pathetic case in the financial realm, anyway. But because I do what lots of other people only pretend to do. I suffered through three universities in America in the 20th century. Could you believe that? Three. And I'm still here. I was called every name in the book, and yet being a straight-A student and a tough debater, um, not much they can do. I got my PhD at a very young age, 26. Now, to get a doctorate degree in American universities, there's a few people out there who might want to take note. You have to take classes at the university. You have to go through a living hell, that is, um, comprehensive examinations, which when I tell you I got a taste of hell, um, I did. I thought I was going to lose my mind. And that's not a figure of speech. I really thought that I was... You don't sleep or anything. It's just uh, um, hallucinations were, were actually a welcome uh, um, detachment from, from what I was dealing with. But to write your dissertation, and then you have to present your dissertation. Now, in my case, it almost became a riot, because my war, of course, has always been against nominalism, and I chose one of nominalism's great 20th century enemies, Michael Oakeshott, the British Hegelian, later British Hegelian, uh, so-called British idealist or Platonist, um, who died in 1990, 1991. Um, Uninteresting to me, really, only except in, in metaphysics, which is usually the one thing that everyone ignores, which made me no friends there. I'm proud to say that um, mine was the best attended of uh, dissertation defenses in the world, but that's what it required to get a doctorate degree. So, for those of you who haven't done that, <clears throat> please stop calling yourself doctor. Please. Unless you've done that, um, stop using the title. I've earned my title, and I use it very proudly because I suffered for it. Now, um, anyway, um, that, that means quite a bit to me, uh, and I say all this only because I went through all the work, I went through all the labor, and I suffered. Now, I've been fired from two universities, now St. Mary's University and Penn Highlands uh, College here in, in Johnstown, and maybe Penn State, I'm not sure. I only taught a couple classes there in 2014, and uh, they were all my student evaluations, as always, were almost perfect, um, but um, I don't know. I don't know what really happened there, but uh, I was at a campus, truly, that was disappearing, uh, Mount Alto, uh, but um, but I've suffered. I've paid my dues. Um, and uh, so I asked for assistance really based more on that than anything else. Then what you get from me is 25 years of suffering, not 25 years of, of knowledge or study. That's all very nice. But I started this battle Christmas Day, 1989. I think I've mentioned this before, when Nikolai Ceausescu was shot after a very brief trial by his own army. I was a musician, as many of you know, and um, I said to myself, if this is going on on my TV screen, as wonderful as music is, it just seems to me so trite in comparison. The wall came down and everything else, and I changed. I was at the University of Hartford at the time, uh, one of the most Jewish universities in America, by the way, West Hartford, Connecticut. 
and a very exclusive school. And um, I changed completely. I signed up for what amounted to a counter-revolution. Now, of course, the left is running around saying we never really supported the Soviet system. We want something like they have, or at least they had in Sweden, or something vague like that. But then they used to say that we were all for the third world nationalism, well, unless they're Assad or anyone like that. The left is in absolute disarray, and that's fun to watch. But the right is just as bad, of course. And it's often not their fault. Um, I'm not going to talk about Donald Trump, um, because that's been done to death. I didn't vote for anybody, so I'm not responsible for anything. Um, so with me in this show, you are getting 25 years of almost constant pain. Thankless, grinding pain. And it's not an accident, you know, that I often, well, one of the biggest sources of the suffering is looking around me and seeing all those who seem to be doing better, better financially, better emotionally, even spiritually, with lives short on meaning, but long on some kind of satisfaction, at least as far as I can tell. Max wife used to tell me, you know, your way is wrong. Your way is pain. My way, conformity, we actually had this discussion, believe it or not, my way is easier. I'm happier than you are, Matthew. Frankly, I didn't have an answer to her at the time. I don't have an answer to her now. There was a moment, I know this is an odd thing to bring up now, but there was a moment I had helped organize a conference at the Barnes Review. I think it was 2001 or 2002. And I was instrumental in bringing E. Michael Jones to speak. Um, two men who influenced me probably more than any other two writers working and living today. E. Michael Jones and Michael Hoffman. And I got Jones. I invited Michael Hoffman, actually. He sent me a very nice note. I uh, always supported him. He, he remembered that. And um, But Jones made And I gave him a very long, flowery speech uh, as an introduction, talking about how you know he kept me sane in grad school, and that was absolutely true. It was an odd thing. When I mean, you think of the uh, typical attendee of a conference like that, well, I don't know where it was. This absolutely gorgeous blonde. I don't know what she was doing there. She was all by herself. She couldn't have been more than 17 or 18. She didn't seem to be attached to anybody. She just kind of wandered in. And she was at every conference. She was at every, she would disappear. Not that I blame her. The typical right-wing male, God knows what they would have done. But, um, but so it was pretty smart to just, you know, get out of there in between speeches. But I had a very odd experience. I was across the room, and she was sitting right behind E. Michael Jones. Now, what a picture that was. E. Michael Jones is hunched over, disheveled, talking to himself, you know, looking through papers, stuff falling out of his jacket. And she was extraordinary. Very well put together. God, I mean, if she was a plant, I say plant away, you know, um, almost perfection, you know, uh, visually speaking. And it struck me. I said, that's the choice we have to make. I'm looking at E. Michael Jones and her. And then, of course, I became very depressed because I said, how in the heck is Jones ever going to get the better of a gorgeous female like that? I'm looking at the two of them almost next to each other. And I got very depressed about it because when it comes to absolutely gorgeous blondes like that in the life of a cynicism, in the church service, any normal man is going to go after the blonde, myself included. I said to myself, how, you know, other than sheer sour grapes, how do we ever get to the point where, you know, we live in a different world than she does? Damn it, I want to live in her world. The one was really, poor Mike, um, absolute disaster. You know, he was so disheveled that day, but a brilliant man, one of the great writers living today. And she was absolute perfection. I was saying to myself, how is anyone going to choose him over her? You know, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of mentality. How was anyone going to choose it? I wouldn't choose that. And I remember that scene because it was such graphic detail about the lives that we lead. This is very cold comfort, of course. It doesn't really say much. Because, frankly, even today I go after the blonde over reading a book by E. Michael Jones. I mean, how can you put a church service up against someone like that? It's a very depressing concept. The very fact that there are Christians at all prove God's existence. Generally speaking, it's a pain for me. I'm a Christian because I was forced into it. I was a Christian because I read myself into it. I can't be anything else. It's true. I didn't even want it to be true, but it's true. That is the, the nature of the schism. We have to pick one or the other. And we know Jones is right, but damn, we want to be with that damn blonde. And can't we figure out a way to have both? Well, no, because they have no point of contact between them. And that's unfortunate. So we look at men who live in the blonde's world, and we know what we say to ourselves. I don't have to tell the men listening here what we say to ourselves. It's very unpleasant, but you know what we say to ourselves. And it's very cold comfort for me to sit here and say that in some distant future, our sufferings will end. We don't even know if that's true. One of the great things about the New Testament is that it's the ultimate way to drive people away from you. You know, Christ essentially came to earth, picked the biggest bunch of losers imaginable to follow him. He himself didn't even have a job or a home. Said, you follow me and your life's going to be nothing but suffering. And maybe... A long time from now, you'll reach heaven, which, by the way, he never describes. 
oh yeah, sign me up. And the way that he's murdered and all of his apostles are murdered, how is, any, how is anyone going to you know, choose that? At the time, it must have seemed ludicrous. Yeah, suffer for nothing or live a normal life. And that's essentially what it must have appeared like the typical Jew or Roman at the time. Anyway, that image is essential to what I'm talking about today, the nature of our struggle. I hate to put it that way. Um, that's the nature of, of what we do. The, this show, um, many of you might remember from a long time ago, was originally called The Orthodox Medievalist. That was my idea. I was with The uh, Voice of Reason at the time, and Mike Connor said to me, Medievalist is a little vague. And I said, I know, that's, that's the biggest problem with using the word. He said, what is it? Is it an ideology? Is it a time period? Is it, you know, what are its parameters? You know, lots of things happen in the Middle Ages. Do you mean France? Do you mean Byzantium? You know, and I, you know, yeah, it's really a, really a very, very vague um, term to use, as much as I love it. My website is now called The Orthodox Medievalist. Nationalism, on the other hand, makes a lot of sense. And it's cultural and religious form. We all follow. Uh, the form of all Russia, public honesty, etc. Um, this is a very specific political movement with very specific political goals and great leaders and philosophy. And it's true, generally speaking. It's true. Like any ideology that's ever existed, it's got tons of loose, loose ends. That's the nature of, of language. But it's true. Somewhere along the line, someone got the idea that the nation as a bureaucratic institution is identical to nationalism. I mean, open up your typical, really badly written, poli sci textbook, and that's what you'll read. The French Revolution was based on nationalism. They'll then go on to explain how the French Revolution went on to destroy everything that was specifically French. I mean, the peasantry, the Roman Catholic Church, the hierarchy, the monastics. It doesn't make any sense. How can it be nationalist and then turn around and destroy everything in that nation? That's the condition, that's the situation that we live in. So I, I, I want to make it clear that I remain firm with the concept of nationalism, the Russian Orthodox nationalism in the sense that the Slavophiles maintained it, Dostoevsky maintained it, Gogol maintained it, Robert Onestyev maintained it, but like everything else, there are levels. We're talking today, I'm talking about today, are precisely those levels. You know, deal with the, the Middle Ages. There was no oligarchy that was impossible. You had no centralized political or economic structures, so you couldn't have an oligarchy. You had a tremendous degree of personal freedom and communal freedom. I mean, there was no individual in the modern sense. They're talking about communities, of course. You had a tremendously libertarian approach into the world. There was no centralized uh, regime of any kind. Um, the bureaucracies, even in Rome and Byzantium, were fairly small compared to today. You had no mental illness in the modern sense of the word. Wars didn't slaughter millions and millions. They killed a few thousand. Nuclear um, devastation didn't threaten humanity every five seconds. You didn't have a media controlled by a handful of aliens that made up stories and said they were true. People lived to be roughly 75, between 70 and 75. Remember in the Psalms, in the Old Testament, quite specifically says three score years and ten is how we normally live. Well, it's right in the Old Testament. It says the average lifespan of the Israelite. Score is 20. What's more than that, though, three score years and ten, um, anything more than 70, it seems, is toil and travail. Well, maybe that's a little different now, but um, at the time, they lived as old as we did. You know, they, they lived the, the long life that, that we do. Middle Ages were as close to utopia as humanity is capable of. Most of the problems of humanity were solved. Of course, it was far from perfect. You had disease, and you had infant mortality, and you had ignorance, and you had, you had superstition. But compared to what we have today, anything is a utopia. Compared to what we have today, you know, I mean, this is why Russian nationalists are starting to revere Stalin. I mean, yeah, they're sane. They're very sane people, but even Stalinism, at least there was order there. You lived in 1995 Moscow, where the average lifespan had fallen to 58 or 59 for men. Stalin seemed pretty good. The Russian Empire maintained more or less the medievalist vision for a very long period of time as a third Rome. Um, in my older archives of the Orthodox Nationalist, I have a three-part part series, three, art, uh, three hours of discussion on what exactly medievalist is. So I, I recommend you go back to that uh, to, to catch up. So um, I want to make it clear that I stay firm with nationalism in the sense that I've mentioned and that I've outlined in many, many hours of um, lecture and many, 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 many hundreds of pages of, of writing. My website is rustjournal.org. Now, the problem with my website, of course, that is academic. My articles are long and they're difficult and they require a certain amount of specialized knowledge, at least some of them. And I don't get the hits like the major science do. And I understand that. That's, you know, that's part of them. That's part of that particular approach. But for those few of you who have fought your way through, um, I think you've understood what I've been driving at. You know, all of these articles, all of these speeches, all of these lectures, it's all the same thing. Well, what am I talking about? 
The th same thing is a concept of symphony, symphonia, subornost, the synod of Chalcedon, all essentially one and the same thing from the foreign point of view of political science. My doctoral degree is in the history of political ideas. I was in two departments um, for the most part, uh, really three, history, philosophy, and political science, but political science was my main area. So everything I do and everything I did is always going to be from a political point of view. That's just who I am. Um, the church is much larger than politics. The definition of, of, of the word politics has changed radically. The Middle Ages didn't mean much. It really referred to um, strategic planning in terms of warfare, um, economic policy at the highest level, um, international intrigue, espionage, um, empire building. I mean, at most, that's what politics meant. It was something that elites did. And generally speaking, we left the common people alone. Today, it means everything. Like the definition of anthropology, everything. There is nothing in the modern mentality that is not amenable to social regulation and therefore is not political. Today, social regulation means a bunch of things. It can mean A, dictated to by the Supreme Court, B, given a uh, visage controlled by the press, or C, some sort of a taboo like, like we do here all the time. The image, the power that regulates uh, a certain state of affairs. There's a big difference between power and authority. Authority is the right to do something. It's the right to use coercion. I have an authority in these areas that I'm talking about now, whether it be Russian Orthodox nationalism, uh, related fields. That authority gives me the right to say, shut up and listen. The word doctor is in the Latin dociria, or to teach. It's a license to lecture. Now, this doesn't imply that I have any power, though, most unfortunately. The mission, the struggle that we all have is to get authority and power very, very close together. But in 2017, they've never been further away. Um, Eric Vogelin made the argument that Plato's forms um, were a protest. I mean, not that they weren't real, they are real, but that because political science in Athens had absolutely no relation to any reality at all, had no, no, no relation to, to goodness or truth, that the forms just seemed so distant in a world all by themselves. And people like Socrates, Christ later on, you see this in Dostoevsky's The Idiot, one of my favorite novels, actually my favorite novel of his. Um, you see someone who was pure, Socrates was a pure, Christ was, but there are similar, similar approaches here, being cast into utter depravity. What's going to happen? You take a, say, say a, a young girl, 14 years old, uh, who's been sheltered and has never read a newspaper or looked at a TV show, and you send her to Vegas for a weekend with no oversight. What's going to happen? It's the same concept. When you take purity and you thrust it into depravity, what you get is tragedy. And this is why Socrates was murdered. This is why Christ was murdered. You know, at least the Muslims were able to give some sort of a bribe to their followers. They weren't going to make the mistake that Christ made in refusing to describe heaven. There are no words to describe it, so we didn't say anything about it. No, Muhammad was pretty clear. There's going to be a lot of sex there. There's going to be alcohol there. And there's going to be everything you couldn't do on earth. If that's not proof that it's a fake religion, then nothing is. He's offering a bribe. Follow me, die for the, for the empire, and, you know, you'll have whatever you want in heaven. Virgins know that. Not just women, but virgins. And hundreds of them, actually, far more than you know, Hadith. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. You're exhausted, you know, for eternity. Christ refused to do that. Think of the E. Michael Jones and whoever that girl was. Muhammad realized that most of us, you know, aren't going to leave the blonde behind. He has to give us this bribe and say, you know, there's going to be women up there. There's going to be uh, alcohol up there. There's going to be food and feasting up there. You don't have to worry about work or anything else. And you could watch the Gentiles suffer. We know that's not the case. No one should be bribed to become anything. Christ made a very stark, and very starkly for us. You will suffer, you'll suffer a lot. A lot of the time you won't know why. But if you persevere to the end, you'll know what happened to sin. And that's it. He doesn't go into detail. Even the prophets didn't go into detail. How could he? But if Christ had begun to describe this Las Vegas-style world that Muhammad uh, described, then you know he's false. That kind of a world can't be described anyway. The very fact that it's so easily described in human language uh, shows that it can't be real. Something like that after death, um, almost by definition, your soul is separated from the body. By definition, it's, it's not amenable to, to human speech. We have no direct experience of that kind of thing, so we have no language. Now, I know this has been an awfully long introduction to the topic of today, which I actually have mentioned from the first sentence, and that is the concept of symphony. Symphony is one of these words that Orthodox intellectuals talk about all the time, they never bother to define. When they do define it, it is so banal that you wonder, you know, who's paying these people? It's very, very common. In America, as far as I know, there is no real firm grasp. Now, why Chalcedon is so important? Why do people die for that? All the seminaries will talk about how, how academic and, and, and just, you know, um, 
they didn't all speak Greek, and so um, they didn't understand each other. And so today we have we, we know the truth, and so we can go beyond the Chalcedon debate. No, and there was a reason why people died for that. It's a centerpiece of all human history. Symphony is the voluntary cooperation of human nature and divine nature. Let me make this very clear. It's a shame that in the ancient texts they use kind of stilted language to describe this. When we say human nature, we're not just talking about this uh, abstraction. We're talking about everything that's human, culture, language, economics, military life, academic life, everything that is human, everything that is cultural, and that's what humans create, is in Christ's human nature. It's not an abstract concept at all, um, but in fact is everything that we know to be specifically human. Now, the divine is more difficult because we don't have direct experience quite often, at least I don't, with divinity. Certainly not in essence, which is for a separate discussion, talk about another one of these abused distinctions. But our language there is, is much more limited. Now, thank God, Christianity, you know, in its history is ultimately a Greek religion. I've reminded some of my you know, these pagan jerks who go around saying that Christ was a Jew and this is a Judaic religion. And, you know, Judaism is just uh, the Talmud in disguise. People actually say this. These, more, these poor kids, you know, there's still a few of them around who are saying that, the Ben Classen types, you know. Well, what they don't understand is that Galilee was a very Greek part of the world. It's a shame that it's up to me to say this. Nazareth was surrounded by Greek cities, Greek towns. Christ spoke Latin, else he couldn't have spoken to Pilate. No question he spoke Greek. Look at a map of ancient Galilee and see the towns surrounding Nazareth. They were all Greek towns. This was a Greek religion from day one, at least in the New Testament. The first New Testament was published in Greek, and all the church fathers, with the exception of Augustine, were in Greek. There are, there are a few exceptions, the offering, people like that. But it was a Greek religion in a, in a very broad uh, linguistic sense. I just want to get that out of the way. It's kind of a very important distinction. It comes up quite a bit in, in discussions. I just had a debate with some moron the other day. I don't know why I do this. You know, sometimes I'm 45 years old. I just get dumber when I discuss with these people. Because, you know, I'll go through all of that. I explain how, you know, the origins of Christianity are very, very Greek. And, you know, and then I'll see them debating the next day, saying the same things I just refuted. You know, and I'm too nice a guy to, to go up and say, what, what, what are you saying? I just explained this. This is false. Leading me to believe, of course, as always, there's something more at work here. It has nothing to do with truths or falsehood. It has nothing to do with, with reality. Or there's a need. Now, part of the need is simple knowledge in the sense that if orthodoxy didn't exist, I wouldn't be a Christian. That's certainly true. If my exposure to Christianity was TV preachers, I wouldn't be a Christian. However, I think we live in a time where we can disassociate ourselves from the media. We realize that not just in specific stories that the press may run, but in an entire aura around an institution is as false as the facts that they think they peddle. It's more than just a story or two that they write about a topic, but the entire cultural feeling that we get about the topic, the whole mood and context of the topic, that's also false. What a shame it is, you know, Roman Catholic priesthood now is instantaneously associated with these cases of um, priestly abuse. We can't blame people for being intellectually lazy. It's easy. And those people, as I mentioned before, are happier than we are. Again, unfortunately, we know Michael Jones is right. And the world of the blonde, as pleasant as it is, is wrong. We're always going to be jealous. Don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be jealous, but it doesn't mean it's real. I want to make sure that, you know, with all of the, you know, specific issue-oriented politics out there that everyone's talking about, that's not really all that interesting. Yeah, Trump behaves like a politician. So what? You know, that's not interesting to me. Things like Chalcedon and the concept, concept of the, the symphony of authorities, which is the very nature of orthodox politics, and there can be no orthodox politics outside of it. These are the eternal, the, these are the eternal facts. I said, and I've dedicated my life to the concept. Distinction between the church and the crown. I won't say the state, because such a concept didn't exist at the time. Someone says state and acts like we're all on the same page there is already an incompetent. The crown is very different from the state. Church and crown derive from Chalcedon. As I said, probably the most important event in all Western history. The two natures, the two worlds, as far as humanity was concerned, were equal and they functioned voluntarily, hence the two wills. With only one will, there would be some sort of slavery there, some sort of coercion there. No. As Komiakov says in The Church is One, it's all authority, no power. So much of the traditionalist and the agrarian idea can be reduced to that. The minute authority has to be backed up with violent force, the authority is already rejected. The authority is already gone. It was a central uh, thesis in Edmund Burke's uh, reflections on the revolution in France, that if a custom has to be 
backed up with the threat of force, and the customer is already dead. The two natures, all that is human and all that is divine, they're equal in the sense that they serve one another voluntarily. This is why these ancient heresies were so immensely important. They're not these just academic abstractions. They're to be found in every little choice we make. Now, if the human side were stressed, then the risk of severing man and God was severe. The human side, of course, is modern liberalism, or humanism, one kind or another. On the other hand, if the divinity was stressed, then our autonomy and reason would be compromised. The heresies and errors, not just of the ancient church, but of all time, will always stress one of the two sides at the expense of the other. The result is perversion, the destruction of autonomy, the destruction of man's connection with the divine. Man has to approach divine, the, 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 the divinity, with reason and thought. Leo Karsavin, died in 1952, is um, one of these great Russian philosophers a few people read. Now, the result is that a few people who do read him can say whatever they want on him, and there's really no one around to correct him. Um, he is so essential into orthodox politics, and yet you have a lot of fakers who've never heard of the guy before. The person, the self, in the true sense, not the individual, but the self is a trinity. The hypostasis, that is, the incarnation of substance. Yes, it's itself, of course, and its presence, with the prosopon, the mask, empirical identity. This is the mark of mental health, the symphonic personality. It's based on a set of um, interlocking, nesting, uh, related unities within which the person finds a place. The family is the locus of this personality. It's manifest again in the relationship between the crown and the land. The empire participates in the absolute. It's a single, non-fragmented non object. And these unities, and these unities and how they relate to one another, is a product of love. There are four types of unity in Karsav. And it's, it's extremely important in understanding these things. First, God as being, the ground of all things. Then, the unities that we find, that find in creation, based on becoming. This is what we mean by energy. You know, even Aristotle had a concept of energy. Uh, it was in his idea of becoming. It creates unities, third, that are complete and are not becoming. The actual entity, the, um, the uh, Aristotle's uh, true object, form and essence. I'm uh, sorry, uh, form and accident. And finally, becoming as such for what we do, the energetic striving for perfection. So the self is this nesting set of concepts. For us, as true people, not individuals, an individual is a perversion. The person, however, is not the matter. It's a trinity. The hypostasis is the incarnation of substance. Remember what a hypostasis is. It's how an essence or substance manifests itself in the world. Um, this is absolutely essential. One of these words that's used all the time, but with often very little understanding. Um, and then being itself, usia, the, 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 the uh, substance. For um, I use a capital S. Um, um, those of us who are fans of Spinoza um, know this in, in some detail. And finally, the empirical self. Prosopon is often not really a good thing. Prosopon isn't a mask in the sense that it's deception, although it often is. But prosopon is how we relate to other people. It can be a healthy thing. But in modernity, of course, it's, it's usually a perversion, the empirical self. Prosopon's doctrine is the person. And, and, and usually when this gets translated into English, it just means that he is a liberal extolling individualism. I mean, nothing could be more illiberal than Karsav and symphonic personality. But there is a book out there called um, The Thought of Russian Liberals. I can't, uh, it's not Isaiah Berlin, I can't think of who it is. Karsav in there. Everything is so badly translated, knowing that there's really no one who's going to be able to correct them, you know, not many people care. But symphonic personality, relationship between the person and the supreme personality. The essence of what it is for us to be alive on earth is to strive, to suffer. Because we strive in this world, seeking union with God in the church, we're going to suffer. Now, the social personality is the creation of this whole, because there are no isolated egos. But in functional terms, the largest aspect of this is the nation, the ethnic. And this is important because there can be no integrated personality without a common language. Language, of course, in a very broad sense of all forms of social communication. That's what the nation is. The church and the nation function as persons, conflict and all. Personality is unity and multiplicity, is uh, Karsavin's slogan. Losef has something similar. We talked about Losef on this show before. We talked about what he meant by myth, the pre-logical foundational context for all action, for all understanding, the unity of subject and object before we even make that distinction. The form, and I'm talking about Plato's form, are the substances that exist separate from any particular material manifestation of that thing. He brings it under five headings. Number one, it imposes a limit. We talk about the form of a good act, say. You know, what, what is, what, what, what is um, that which all good acts have in common, for example? Well, the first thing we need to do is, you know, there's so much that we call good, it's such a flux we have to impose some limit and boundary on it. 
It is a function of objects and not a universal in the abstract sense. It's a subject, not merely a formal object. It's a maximum content that an archetype can comprehend. And lastly, that it is a necessary element of existence. Nothing is real without the form of the archetype. You see this also in, in Pamphil Yurkevich. You've got to do a show on Yurkevich. He, no one reads him, um, and he's, he's worth the time. Nothing of his exists in English, as far as I know. Um, and he's very similar to, to Karsavin in terms of the, the symphonic personality. You take any object, any X, any X we come across is always in context. It is never isolated. It is both subjective and objective at the same time. We see it in a certain way and in a certain mood, but we also know that it exists apart from us. It's also part of a broader whole, and this whole is so large, the entire cosmos, God included, of course, it can't be fully reduced to language or any kind of system. Now, as for the object itself, it exists as a unity really only in thought, since thought also is a part of the natural order, then unity must be too. Whenever we take an object out of existence, any object we happen to view it could be an act, it could be, an, it could be a thing, we realize that we're already distorting it because we're taking it out of this massive cosmic context which gave it life in the first place. All phenomena, all things that we perceive, have a residual element that's non-systematic. That is, it can't be made part of an intellectual system, can't be reduced to language. The existence of phenomena show two things. A, the tendency to drag our consciousness down to accidents, to things like the blonde I was talking about, these things that draw our attention. We wish to possess that kind of thing. On the other hand, that they do have the potential of lifting to an ideal. Lukiewicz goes so far as to say that sense data are the subject's projection. The truth and the real are the purely objective, the object without any desire imposed on it. Empiricism and nominalism can't understand this and see any sense, uh, any phenomenon as the only reality that exists. Plato saw reality as open to this transcendent realm, while nominalism, of course, is closed in on itself. Losev, it seems, has the fullest concept of, of symphony. Um, Losev actually spends quite a bit of time on the filioque. For Losev, all of Western history and culture is based on all the philosophical errors of all the dominant schools of the Western world, that is to say the Latin-speaking world, stem from the filioque. I don't remember if I mentioned this in my talk on him or not um, from a few weeks ago. Um, anyway, um, the Trinity is a ground here. It's a model of being. The one exists, this one unity, which has to exist before any multiplicity. And it gives birth to phenomena, the image. And then thirdly, it creates the manifestation of the hypostasis. Remember, the hypostasis is a complex thing. You know, Christ is the hypostasis of the Father. It means that he both possesses that which the Father possesses, but that he's also a person. And he does that at the same time. Now, both the manifestation and the image, that is to say, the Son Spirit, are created by the One. If the manifestation can be created by the image, there's no real need for the One. If Christ produces the Holy Spirit, so to speak, you know, then Christ becomes just an agent of the Father. And Gregory Palamas, the Father, his essence. He alone is being as such, not the Trinity as such, the Father. This is essential to understand. In the Western era, the Father transmits essence or being to the Son. When all is based on the monarchy of the Father, the unity is maintained. When the Son acts as God's agent, then it implies that earthly powers can rule autonomously. Now, Losef didn't come up with this idea. This comes from uh, Photios the Great of Constantinople. And I recognize that so much of this is awfully academic. But for those of you who are pretending to be PhDs in something, this is what we do. Talking like this, it seems so far removed from the marketplace, the crowd, you know. But you would think that, that this all just takes us so far away, not just from the flux, but also from what we're talking about, the crown itself and the synod. Actually, I'd rather do crown and synod rather than church state. What's required for both the crown and the synod have a common point of origin. Their goal, therefore, is identical. Only their meanings are different. This is why the filioque is so essentially important. This is why I'm talking right now. This is the only reason that orthodoxy is true. So botanus is, of course, the final concept. It's an essential concept not only in orthodox theology, but also in Russian history. And the philosophical concept, it is almost um, an emotional, static discovery, experience of the foundation of all things foundation of all being. Love is communion in the true sense of the word, but it's also labor. The Trinity is three persons, but this need not conflict with the fact that their essence is identical, because for any two objects to interact, a third object is necessary to provide the meaning and context for their interaction. Essence is revealed in action. It's personality. Accident, things like, you know, color, and appearance, things like that, is dead matter. It's fluid. Ultimately, it's meaningless. The Islamic idea 
The monotheistic idea that God is a tyrant, he is isolated and unrelated, he is not a father. That's a law. The Trinity is community, it's a sobar. There is a shared essence with independent persons, not individuals. The Holy Spirit is the action, he is the revelation of personhood. Christ is the head, while the spirit is the heart. Personhood implies social unity, the foundation of myths, myth in most of sense. It's also just occurred to me that we're running out of time. Um, so let me finish this up the way I meant to. What is the church? Komiakov says this, the church visible or upon earth lives in complete communion and unity with the whole body of the church of which Christ is the head. She has abiding within her Christ and the grace of the Holy Spirit and all their fullness, but not in the fullness of their manifestation, for she acts and knows not fully, only so far as it pleases God. In the um, 17th century epistle with the Eastern patriarchs, um, they were answering the Calvinists and basically said um, that the church embraces all people. Past, president to come who believe in Christ. Some on their earthly pilgrimage who haven't come to heaven yet. But we don't confuse, this is a quote now, we do not in the least confuse the church in pilgrimage with the church that has reached the homeland. Just because a certain heretics think one and the other both exist, that they both comprise, as it were, two flocks of a single uh, chief shepherd, God, and are sanctified by one Holy Spirit, such a confusion is absolutely impossible. Inasmuch as one is battling and still on the way, like we are, while the other is already celebrating its victory, and has reached the fatherland and has received the reward, something which will follow also for the entire universal church. End quote. It is a communal body. Uh, St. John Maximovich says, Now the church consists both of earthly and heavenly parts. The Son of God came to earth and became man that it might lead man to heaven and make him once again a citizen of paradise, turning to him his original condition of sinlessness and wholeness, uniting them to himself. Now you notice in this talk about church, I've mentioned a bishop once. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. This isn't about power. This is about the source of authority. Ah, now what's the state? Well, state should be in quotes, because the concept is a modern one. St. Isidore Seville says the following. Every mark of power is not always useful, but only when it's properly born. Now it is properly born when it benefits the subjects over whom it is placed in worldly honor. Power is good, which comes from God who grants it, that it may coerce evil by fear. Not that it may freely commit evil itself, of course. Nothing is worse than through power to have the liberty of sinning. Nothing is more miserable than the power of doing evil. End quote. Talk about Justinian. The great uh, emperor, he writes in his institutes, civil law is distinguished from the law of nations. Every community governed by laws and customs uses partly its own law, partly laws common to all mankind. The law which the people makes for its own government belongs exclusively to that state and is called the civil law, as being the law of the particular state. But the law which natural reason appoints for all men obtains equally among all nations, because all nations make use of it. The people of Rome then are governed partly by their own laws and partly by the laws which are common to all men. You will take notice of this distinction as occasion may arise. This is absolutely essential. People sometimes ask me, how can you be such a Byzantinist and believe in the old Russian Empire and be a nationalist? It doesn't make any sense. Well, I quote that passage. He's saying exactly what it means. He mentions Chalcedon, although not explicitly, of how um, one law, two manifestations. The first is common to all men. The virtues, for example. There's no society in the world that didn't extol marriage. No society in the world that didn't usually kill adulterers and homosexuals. There's no society in the world that extolled cowardice. These things are part of what it is to be human. On the other hand, the things that are specific to a particular people are the nation. Customs and language that distinguish one from another. This is why the Orthodox Church is organized along ethnic lines. This is not an accident. Natural law doesn't need to enforce uniformity. Remember, an empire is not a state. An empire is not, we talk about empire, we talk about the empire of, of uh, you know, Byzantium or, or Bulgaria, whatever it is in the Middle Ages. Um, empires weren't governments in our sense of the term. I, I've lectured on this topic many times and, and it doesn't quite penetrate. Let me, let me try it this way. In the Russian Empire, Poland didn't relate to the emperor in the same sense as Florida might relate to the bureaucracy of Washington, D.C. Very, very different relationship. In the American example, it's a modern state. The federal government forces its will on people, whether it likes it or not. It doesn't even make reference to natural law, just they're more powerful. Ultimately, this is the you know this is how it works out. Um, Poland in the Russian Empire was completely independent. These distinctions didn't exist. The, the mentality was completely different. Uh, Poland was totally self-governing, which actually in that case was, was a bad thing, because they maintained serfdom a lot longer than it needed to be. Um, but, uh, and of course, Jewish control in the Polish Empire continued even under um, Petersburg. You can't make reference to empires like their states, like their countries, in our sense. They don't, doesn't, doesn't function that way. Maybe another example. Here's, here's uh, Alcuin writes this to Charlemagne. 
There have been up to this time three persons most highly placed, the apostolic sublimity, which is want to rule the seat of blessed Peter, the prince of the apostles, by vicarious power. Another is the imperial dignity, the secular power of the second Rome. And the third is a royal dignity in which the dispensation of the Lord Christ has made you, Charlemagne, ruler of the Christian people, greater in power than the other aforesaid dignitaries, greater in power, more famous in wisdom, more sublime in ruling power, upon you the entire safety of the churches of Christ repose. End quote. Now you know why Aquin was never canonized by the Roman church. There could be no church in the sense that we use the term without the social protections. It couldn't function. Uh, states and nations uh, offer this. And this is why Alcuin says, uh, more blessed in wisdom, in other words, your responsibility is far greater. The papal ideology, of course, overthrew this. And it developed through no fault of its own in the absence of any actual functional Roman government. Now, the Al uh, for Alcuin, the emperor was different from the state. That term is, is unfortunate. He is a ruler of Christendom. Even the term ruler doesn't mean the same thing. He is the icon of righteousness. He doesn't tell people what to do. That's We already know that. He has more power, though, than popes and bishops. He has more responsibility. Speaking of Charlemagne more specifically, he is to be more wise and more sublime in the use of his power. Now, we're talking about something, talking about the same period of time here, roughly. The idea of Roman authority was being revised in the light of the truth. Rome was the center of the world since it provided the backdrop of the Incarnation. All the verses for the Nativity talk about the empire unifying the world through laws and roads, etc., and so Christ deliberately came in human flesh only when this unity was manifest. The liturgical mention of the empire and the verses for the Feast of the Incarnation have not been used explicitly to explain this, though. But the crown is fundamental. Christ did not come except for a time when the law of the empire was singular in Justinian's sense, and its enforcement could be made much easier through a unified infrastructure. During Vespers on Christmas Eve, we read, for example, when Augustus reigned alone upon the earth, the many kingdoms of men came to an end. The city of the world passed under a single rule, and the nations came to believe in the one single Godhead. Chalcedon, I have to wrap this up very quickly here, is manifest in the social doctrine of symphony. The temporal power of the priesthood relate to um, the temporal power uh, and the priesthood relate to each other as body to soul. For moderns, the language will appear very strange. The priest, of course, refers to all elements of the church, like monastic, lay piety, sacraments, liturgy, etc. And it's universal in Plato's sense. It also refers to the symbolic connection of heaven and earth. At the same time, the temporal power, one strictly orthodox in behavior, the modern concept of state, of course, didn't exist, nor did this concept of secular meaning worldly exist. I think um Paul in Plato. Uh, he's addressing um, Catherine the Whore, Catherine the Great, and he says that the church and society are connected in such a way that they're distinct, they're different, really only in attitude. Civil society is a union of people united by laws in the same form of government, but that this same society is also united by the collective observance of one form of worship in the same sacred rites, the church. Now, it's a very poor explanation, but he is talking to Catherine the Second. Let me give you a better one. A.D. in Grodowski, 1875, he says the following, the rights of the autocratic power He's talking about the crown now, not the state. Relate only to the church administration and not the content of the positive side of religion, of course, like doctrine and ritual. This is the same for the Orthodox Church and for other faiths. The competence of the supreme legal authority is limited to those cases that affect the external side of church administration. They don't involve acts that define the heart of the universal church, such as the decisions of the ecumenical synods, and I am now over time. I apologize for that. Uh, I may have to continue this, actually, in the next uh, in the next segment. I may do that. But if I don't, Let's conclude it this way. We live in an age where words don't mean the same thing as they did 100 years ago, let alone 2,000 years ago. We have to be extremely careful in what we're talking about. There is no church state unless those two concepts are defined. There is the synod of bishops. There is a divine nature. There is a monastic line, the ascetic line on the one hand, and then there is the crown. There is the, the icon of, of the virtues in, in temporal life. Neither one of those two things are secular in our modern sense of the term. The concept of Chalcedon is orthodox government. There is the culture, the nation, the people, the crown, and then there is the church, the monastic life, our struggle. They have one source, they have one origin, they also have one purpose. They only differ in terms of ends. You would think that this is a simple idea, but it's not. Nothing is more uh, complex than it's most unfortunate. Um, so uh, the concept finally ultimately comes down to this. One of the ancient heresies came to rule. Could be Arianism, could be, it doesn't really matter. Um, the idea of symphony derives directly from subordinates. Symphony is this union of divine and human. Uh, Porensky even goes so far, he, he compares it to a folk ensemble, where singers are not necessarily following a strictly written down composition, but they can be flexible and inventive with in certain aspects. But given the basic understanding of all the singers together, mutual adjustment, this sort of creativity is easy, it's organic. 
This is our human life. But when one rules over the other, when a bishop says that he's all and everything, whether it be one of these TOC bishops or, or the Pope of Rome, or when humanists say that your will and drives and therefore the state is everything, or capital, they both err. Same heresy, different day. Thank you. Talk to you next time.